Christian Missionary Treatment of Christian Missionary Treatment of Islam. The systematic and calculated use of falsehood is fundamental principle of Christian missionary activity. The English Dictionary defines lie as intentional false statement, imposture, be deceptive, convey a false impression. If one were to say it is the methodology of the Christian missionary to lie about Islam, this claim would have a ring of truth to it. Their endeavors have not only left Islam as a misunderstood religion in the West, but also one that is mistreated. This methodology has as its origin a seldom publicized statement of Paul in which he is happy to proclaim. If through my falsehood God's truthfulness abounds to his glory, why am I still being condemned as a sinner? Romans 3. 7. Paul felt little reluctance in spreading falsehood so long as the end result achieved the greater glory of God. One will never know, therefore, whether his claimed vision of Jesus on the Damascus Road, his appointment as preacher to the Gentiles, and the other teachings he propagated in the name of Christianity were all part of this use of falsehood or not. He would have done well to take into consideration another biblical text, a faithful witness does not lie, but a false witness breathes out lies. Proverbs 14. 5. Paul, by his own admission, proves himself not to have been a faithful witness. How much better later Christian missionaries fared as faithful witnesses will be discussed below. Nevertheless, this does not make for a promising start, Paul, the champion of Christianity, admitting to the use of falsehood. Missionary efforts in preaching the gospel are hardly worthy of emulation. In 1795 the London Missionary Society was formed, its immediate attention focused upon the Pacific, two years later a convict ship bound for Australia put the first missionaries ashore on Tahiti. It was four years before any of them learned enough of the local language to be able to preach a sermon to a puzzled though sympathetic audience. The Tahitians built houses for them, fed them, and provided them with servants galore, but after seven years not a single convert to Christianity had been gained. The missionaries opted for a more brutal tactic and gained the upper hand by helping to reduce the local chief to an alcoholic and then offered him backing in a war against other islands' chief spy. Supplying firearms, the enemy having only wooden clubs to defend themselves. Assistance was provided, however, on the condition that all the islanders would have to accept Christianity once victory had been gained. The whole nation was converted in a day. With their power base firmly established in Tahiti, the missionaries moved swiftly to the outer islands. The methods they employed were as before. A local chieftain would be baptized, crowned king, introduced to large quantities of alcohol and left to the work of converting his own people. Chieftains who put up any form of opposition were quickly shown the might of the missionary forces. Where no resistance was found, a native teacher supported by a half-dozen missionary police would take over an island within a week. Norman Lewis, The Missionaries, Arena 1989, pages 10-15 The missionaries had little need to take recourse to the use of falsehood in Tahiti. The natives were easy prey for the military strength the missionaries were able to muster. Where, however, the target audience was not so easily convinced or where little or no inroads were being made. It was time once again to make use of Paul's motto falsehood in whatever form was most appropriate. The missionary attack on Islam, for the most part, was to follow this strategy. The earliest Christian reactions to Islam were much the same as they have been in modern times. The approach often takes a severe attitude in condemning whatever a Muslim believes, including the whole of what he believes about God and, in particular, what he believes about Jesus Christ. Regarding some of the early authors who wrote against Islam, Normal Daniel asks, Regarding some of the early authors who wrote against Islam, Normal Daniel asks, It is natural to ask how authors whom we can neither patronize as foolish nor condemn as unscrupulous could consistently have misrepresented facts, regularly crediting ridiculous fantasies. This applies particularly to their treatment of the events of Muhammad's life, but to some extent also to the whole of their attitude to Islam. We cannot just excuse them as ignorant. Norman Daniel, Islam and the West, One World Publications, 1993, page 255. It was the works of authors of this caliber that Christianity was to use in its attacks on Islam. Authors who misrepresented facts and worked within the sphere of ridiculous fantasies Paul's motto comes to mind yet again. There is very little that the neutral observer can do under such circumstances. Who does he believe? The methodology used by these authors is further described by Norman Daniel. All writers tended more or less to cling to fantastic tales about Islam and its prophet. The use of false evidence to attack Islam was all but universal. Ibid, page 267, he goes on to explain. 
at the worst there was the assertion of the fantastic, in its repetition without discrimination. At the best there was the selection of only those facts that served the purpose of controversy. Ibid, page 268. All of this comes as no surprise. Islamic Institutions, Daniel continues. All of this comes as no surprise. Islamic Institutions, Daniel continues. Were treated as selectively as the life of Muhammad. Yet the more sober accounts of Islam resemble the more sober biographies of the Prophet in that actual facts were manipulated by selection and omission, by exaggeration and invention and misapplication. Ibid, page 269. A further passage from Islam and the West will help to shed more light on the treatment which was being meted out to Islam. The Christian canon of Muslim behavior, that is, the received Christian opinion as to what Muslims actually did, was partly formed by the tendency of misconceptions to snowball and to confirm as well as to add to one another. Mere repetition is enough to bring unshakable conviction. And once it had been asserted that Islamic teaching was sexually lax, every example of laxity would be noticed from that moment, and, once notified, attributed to the doctrine. If we suppose that there were an equal number of similar offenses committed by Christians and by Muslims in any given time, in the former case they would be seen as having occurred in spite of the doctrine, so that each individual case would be an exception and in the latter it would be assumed that doctrine was the cause of whatever happened. Ibid, page 270. This is a very acute observation that is still valid today. Whatever a Muslim is seen to be doing, reflects upon Islam itself. Terrorism, murder, violence, wherever these occur with possible Muslim involvement, the automatic response is that it is because Islam permits it, rather even encourages it. All of this without onlookers making the slightest referral to the religious teachings of Islam itself. People seem to take it for granted that an alien society, which for many is what Islam is, is dangerous, if not hostile. Apparently, and history has shown this to be the case, under the pressure of their sense of danger, whether real or imagined. A deformed image of their enemies' beliefs and intentions takes shape in men's minds. This invariably contrasts with what the other party actually believe and what they say they believe, but by this stage this has little effect in changing people's preconceived ideas. The enemy must not be allowed to speak for itself. Ibid, page 12, slightly adapted. Under such circumstances, only those matters favorable to one's own argument are broadcast and those favorable to the other party either ignored or distorted. Norman Daniel further explains how this occurred in regards to Islam. Not only in treating the life of Muhammad and the sexual institutions of Islam, but in all aspects of that religion, facts were exaggerated, sometimes out of little or nothing. and were often distorted almost beyond recognition, sound information was regularly discarded for unsound. Only in matters apparently favorable to Christianity was a very high degree of accuracy achieved, as, for example, in treating the Quranic beliefs about Christ and his mother. Ibid, page 270. To misrepresent another religion for fear of people converting is one thing, but to do so to one's own in the hope of gaining converts is another. Christian missionaries, unable to convince the Panar Indians of the Colorado Valley to accept faith in Jesus Christ took to compiling books for the natives to read in their mother tongue. This was accomplished during 1975 and 1976. It was soon realized, however, that before the Indians could be made to accept repentance and salvation one had to give them something to feel guilty about. The missionaries came up with an ingenious, yet underhand, solution to translate the New Testament in such a way so as to implicate the Panar Indians in Jesus' death. Gone from the Bible were Judas's betrayal, the Romans, the trial, and Pontius Pilate. The text now read at the appropriate places, the Panar killed Jesus Christ, because they were wicked. Let's kill Jesus Christ, said the Panar. They laid a cross on the ground, etc. The New Testament continued. God will burn you all. God will exterminate the Panar by throwing them on the fire. Do you want to be roasted in the fire? asks God. Do you have something to pay me with so that I won't roast you in the fire? What is it you're going to pay me? One does not have to think hard in order to realize what payment was being demanded. Namely, unquestioning submission to the missionaries' demands, the abandonment of their traditional lives and their customs, and the acceptance of Christianity. The Indians were terrified. The first Indian woman came forward and said, I don't want to burn in the big fire. I love Jesus. Adapted from Norman Lewis, The Missionaries, Arena 1989, pages 188-192.
the end had justified the means, and, as far as the missionaries were concerned, the Indians had attained salvation in Jesus. The fact that they had to distort their own Bible to achieve their goal was of no consequence. Interestingly, we are not told whether they continued to use the very same distorted Bible when further teaching the Indians if so. The Panar Indians would certainly have had a very unique and warped understanding of the life of Jesus. Paul's motto springs to mind. Missionary Traps for Muslims By Max Zudoftab Managing Editor of the Islamic Herald, The Islamic Herald, April 1996 Part 1, Faith and Works One of the basic arguments raised by non-Muslims, especially Christians, against Islam concerns the concept of salvation. They say that in Christianity, one is saved by faith, whereas in Islam one must earn their salvation through good deeds. Unfortunately, many Muslims fall into the trap of defending the position imposed on them by these non-Muslims. This then provides the Christians with a basis for their entire Jesus Father Crucifixion Salvation Framework. They then go on to argue that salvation is a gift from God that cannot be earned. But if the true Islamic concept is made clear, the Christian has no basis to attack Islam. Many times, Muslims fail to realize that the Islamic concept of salvation is not based upon good deeds, but is based primarily upon faith. In the dozens of times Allah talks in the Quran about salvation, He always states, those who believe and do good deeds. Belief is always mentioned before deeds or works. When one converts to Islam, one does not do it by doing some good work but rather through realizing and believing that there is but one God and Muhammad, peace and blessing of Allah be upon him, is his last messenger. Non-Muslims may perform good works as well, but what sets them apart from Muslims is their lack of Iman, or belief. The reason that the good works of the non-believers are worthless in the hereafter is because of their disbelief. Unless a person's Iman or Akita is not correct, all his good deeds are worthless. One of the more popular hadiths of the Prophet, peace and blessing of Allah be upon him, states, all actions are based upon intentions, implying that the purpose, intent, or Iman behind your action is what you get rewarded for, the actual action is really a consequence of the belief. Another hadith states, A man came to the Prophet, peace and blessing of Allah be upon him, and asked, when will the day of judgment come? The Prophet, peace and blessing of Allah be upon him, replied, What have you prepared for the judgment day that you are so concerned for it? He replied, I do not have any good deeds in my account, but I do have one thing, I love Allah and his messenger, peace and blessing of Allah be upon him. Dot. The Prophet, peace and blessing of Allah be upon him, then said, In that case, do not worry, you will be with those whom you love. Agreed upon. This hadith also confirms the Islamic position of placing akita and belief before actions. For example, Allah says in various parts of the Quran, the believers you will find praying. He does not say the people who are praying are believers. It is the belief that brings about the action, but the converse is not always true. Another hadith of the Prophet, peace and blessing of Allah be upon him, states, unless one loves Allah and Allah's messenger more than one's own self as Aman is not complete. Part 2, The Bible Another misunderstanding Muslims often fall into concerns the Bible. Christian missionaries in almost every discussion of the Quran assert that the Quran asks Muslims to believe in the Bible as a revelation of God. Many Muslims tend to fall into this trap by saying that we believe in the Bible as revealed book. Once the Muslim accepts this fact, the evangelist can point out that the Bible contradicts the Quran and that since the Bible has precedence over the Quran and since Muslims are required to believe in it, it therefore logically follows that the Bible is right and the Quran is wrong. But the Quran says no such thing. There is no reference to the Bible in the Quran whatsoever. The Quran mentions the Taurat and the Injil. The Taurat is the book given to Prophet Moses. This is not the equivalent of the Torah Pentateuch of the Jews and Christians, since much of it was not written by Prophet Moses. And the Taurat is definitely not the Old Testament since the OT includes dozens of books attributed to other prophets before Jesus. The Injil is translated as the Gospel revealed to Prophet Jesus. This is not the New Testament. The New Testament is a collection of four biographies of Christ, 27 epistles of St. Paul, and other books on the lives and adventures on the followers of Christ. There is no record of a book revealed to Jesus. Perhaps the closest to it are the words of Jesus himself, which constitutes less than 10% of the NT. Therefore to say that Christians changed the Bible is an inaccurate statement, and can cause trouble in a discussion, because the Christian can then ask questions such as. Who changed the Bible? When exactly was it changed? 
How do you know it was changed if you don't have a copy of the original? The Bible, or at least the New Testament, cannot be an altered copy of the Injil because it is a completely different book. In fact, the original Bible or New Testament, the very first one, did not correspond to the Injil, Taurat, or Zabur in the first place. It doesn't matter how unreliably it was transmitted, the Bible does not correspond to the Quranic Injil. It is not that the Christians have changed the original, but rather they have the wrong book, altogether. The words of Christ are possibly the closest thing to the Injil. The recently discovered Gospel of Thomas, which is nothing but a list of sayings of Jesus, is even closer to the Islamic concept of Injil. Therefore, it should be kept in mind in discussion with Christians that the Bible has not been changed, but rather the original documents chosen as the Word of God were incorrect. He wants to specialize in calling Christians to Islam. Question I have seen Christians in Morocco came from Europe for missionary work. They left their homes and desires and are using the best techniques their civilization could reach in service for their belief. They are spreading in all Africa. Truthful is Allah who says, and they will never cease fighting you until they turn you back from your religion, Islamic monotheism, if they can. I want to be specialized in facing Christians. I want to study Christianity, I think we are in need of such specialty. Especially in our country, I heard that young men here wear the cross and put it on their clothes. I need your guidelines to enlighten my way to this study. I wish you provide me with a program includes both Islamic and Christian studies. May Allah reward you. Answer. Praise be to Allah. What you mention about the activities of some missionaries and their patience in traveling and making sacrifices is something that is well known. If this is their state even though they are promoting falsehood and striving for the sake of falsehood, then how about the Muslim whom Allah has blessed with guidance and taught in the path of truth? Undoubtedly he, of all people, should be striving and making the effort, sacrificing that which is most dear to him, in order to spread the religion of Islam and teach and guide people. Whether they are Christians or others. The Prophet, peace and blessings of Allah be upon him, said, Advance cautiously, until you reach their open space, then invite them to Islam, and tell them of their duties before Allah. By Allah, if Allah were to guide one man through you, that would be better for you than having red camels. Narrated by Al-Bakari, 3009, and Muslim, 2406. The path of Dua, calling others to Islam, is the path of the prophets and messengers, because they were the most compassionate of people towards people, and the keenest of people to guide people. But it is a path that needs provision, namely knowledge, patience and certainty of faith. You have done well to ask about the way to specialize in debating with the Christians, because some people indulge in this field without preparation. And that may lead to his putting his opponent off or making him cling more steadfastly to his falsehood, or it may lead to him becoming weak himself and being filled with doubts. Hence the one who wants to strive for the sake of Allah and call these people to Islam and debate with them should pay attention to a number of matters. 1. Studying sound Akita from reliable sources, directly from scholars if possible. 2. Acquiring Shari knowledge which will correct his worship and interactions with others, because learning this is an individual obligation, and it takes precedence over the duty of calling others. 3. Paying attention to Islamic sources which deal specifically with calling Christians to Islam and discussing their situation and their specious arguments. There are many such sources, among the most important of which are, Al-Jawab al-Sahili man battle ad din al-Masid by Sheikh al-Islam ibn Taymiyyah. Hidayat al hayara fi Ajwaba al-Yahud wa al-Nazara by Ibn al kaim Izar al-Haq by Sheikh Ramathala al-Hindi, available in English. Manazira Baina al-Islam wa al-Nazraniya by Sheikh Muhammad Jamil Ghazi, al Aqaidi al Wathaniya fi al Dayanana al-Nazraniya by Muhammad Tahir al Tanner. Muhadarat fi al Nazraniya by Sheikh Abu Zara, al Masuwa al Muyasara fi al Adian wa al Madhaib al Muasira, al Nazraniya min al Tahid ila al Tathleeth by Dr. Muhammad Ahmad al Hajj. Muhammad fi al Kitab al Muqaddas by Prof. Abd al Ahad Dawood, available in English under the title Muhammad in the Bible. Dirayasat fi al Adian, al Yahudi al Wal Nazraniya by Dr. Saud al Khalif. And Reza al Wa Man Azarat by Sheikh Ahmad Didat. Sheikh Ahmad Didat's booklets and videos are widely available in English. You can also benefit from websites that specialize in this topic, such as the following, in Arabic. To debate in a polite and fair manner, and look at the one who disagrees with him in a compassionate manner. So he should be keen to guide him and strive to convey the truth to him, like a sympathetic doctor treating his patient. So he should not mock him or laugh at him, and he should not act superior or arrogant, rather he should call him to the way of his Lord with wisdom and beautiful preaching. 
and respond in the way that is better, as Allah says, interpretation of the meaning. And argue not with the people of the scripture, Jews and Christians, unless it be in, a way, that is better, with good words and in good manner, inviting them to Islamic monotheism with his verses. Except with such of them as do wrong, and say, to them we believe in that which has been revealed to us and revealed to you. Our Allah, God, and your Allah, God, is one, i.e. Allah, and to him we have submitted, as Muslims. al 29,46 O believers! Do not discuss and debate with the Jews and Christians to whom the divine books were revealed, except in the best of manners and most exemplary of ways. Inviting them by exhortation and establishing clear proofs. As for those of them who oppress by showing stubbornness and arrogance, fight them until they submit, or pay to Josiah with their own hands while subdued. And say to the Jews and the Christians, I have believed in whatever Allah has revealed to us in the Quran, and in the Torah and Gospel that was revealed to you. Our Lord is one and so is yours, He has no partner in His Lordship, worship or perfection, and we submit and humble ourselves to Him alone. Surah al ankabut 46 al Qurtubi said in his tafsir, It is permissible to argue with the people of the book in the way that is better, in the sense of calling them to Allah and pointing out the sound evidence and proofs. In the hope that they may respond to the call of faith, not by way of proving them to be wrong and treating them harshly. End quote. Many Christians, when they hear the arguments of the Muslims and realize that what they were following is wrong, believe and are guided, and they succeed and prosper. Using good methods and calling people has a powerful effect in that regard. We should re-emphasize at this point the importance of arming oneself with Shari knowledge and studying this matter in depth, which has become a branch of knowledge in its own right nowadays. Before indulging in it, because if you indulge in this matter before preparing yourself and studying enough about it, your weakness and incapability will backfire against the religion which you want to promote and defend. Strive to make contact with people in your country who are specialized in this field, and whose religious commitment and knowledge can be trusted. To help you with this matter and guide you to what you need. We ask Allah to help and guide you. And Allah knows best to.